I was working particularly in a, in a slum near Gandhi Ashram, and I'd met a guy in the slum who was better than me in every possible way. And he was smarter than me, he was harder working than me, he was even more compassionate than, than me. And the only way that I was better than him was that in a single year, I would make more money than he could make in five lifetimes. And that was incomprehensible to me. Here was this person who, by all of the metrics of the world, and even metrics that the world doesn't um, appreciate, like compassion, you know, he exceeded me. And yet in this one dimension that we try and funnel every interaction and transaction through, which is through the lens of money, he would never be able to reach my level. Investment dates back to the origins of money and has served very beneficial functions in supporting healthy flows of wealth. But the investment banking world lost its mooring in the real economy and morphed into a global casino with disastrous consequence. If you look at the amount of money in the world, there's no shortage of money, but most of the money being made and exchanged in the world is money making money off of money and derivatives and arbitrage. I think maybe the estimate is 5% of the money exchanges that go on in the world have anything to do with goods, services, or capital equipment and building capital capacity. I got to a point in my junior year where I had done the networking and I connected with people at the banks down in New York and, um, and I became in their social circuit and I got to really get to know these people and see the lifestyle beyond the office. My two good friends who were in these banks that were working not on rare occasions, 90 hour work weeks and then partying like crazy to, to get some kind of release from that kind of stressful environment. And it was just not what I wanted to be a part of. The idea that I had attached myself to of going to a bank working for the market and and being able to to make that kind of significant paycheck and income that would that would allow me to free myself from the financial burdens of not only just taking on the debt to go to university but but to really have the financial resources to do the things that I was passionate about and in the process of attaching myself to that goal I I got so removed from the things I was actually passionate about to begin with the finance sector, otherwise known as Wall Street, doubled in size over the last 14 years. Without us noticing, this massive growth in the finance sector decoupled it from the real economy. For example, in 2008, the value of all goods and services produced globally totaled $70 trillion, while the value of all financial assets in the world peaked at $194 trillion. So we're starting to see this financial sector take over our economy. The financial sector is not economically productive. It means it doesn't make widgets, it doesn't make cars. It's a paper shuffling aspect within our economy now that is beginning to dwarf all else. I would say it's um, uh, planet finance now is getting bigger than planet Earth. An efficient financial system um, is like an electric utility and it should be really run like a public utility. And uh, any financial system that is using up more than 10% of a country's GDP um, is inherently out of control and kind of metastasizing and becoming a cancer on the real economy. What the economy is doing is literally turning the living wealth of people, community, and nature into financial wealth, which is nothing but a fiction to begin with. So this becomes essentially an act of theft of the real resources of the rest of the world. And that's, that is this distinction between phantom wealth, which is pure money unrelated to the creation of anything of real value, versus real wealth, which if properly understood, 
um, you know, the most valuable forms of real wealth are those things that are totally beyond price, which are, you know, love, a healthy, happy child, a strong family, a caring community, or a healthy natural environment. The financialization of the economy in the 90s intoxicated the entire country with the illusion of easy money. It was only a matter of time before the finance industry developed new money-making instruments that promised even higher returns. These financial instruments, such as derivatives, launched a new realm of borrowing and wealth creation that inebriated the country even more. Agonized investors sent stocks plunging once again Wednesday. Two disheartening reports convinced Wall Street that a recession, if not already here, is inevitable. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis. What happened was very similar to what happened in 1929 before the great uh, crash and depression at that time, was the pyramiding of paper assets and the creation of all of these fancy derivative instruments. And a derivative just means that it doesn't have, uh, this piece of paper doesn't have any real value, but it's based on the value of something else that's real on the ground. Derivatives made the market more efficient by making it easier for banks to manage their risk. But the new instruments opened the floodgates on the global casino, simultaneously eroding market stability. The immediate cost of the financial crisis was the treatment of money in the housing market. We took huge bets, the banks, even the government, and certainly the people. If you go to Las Vegas, they don't let you play unless they know you have the money to pay. Well, if only the financial institutions had followed the Las Vegas, way of doing business, we wouldn't be in this situation. The financial casinos surged out of control with bets so large they boggled the mind. The investment banks placed bets that were 30 to 40 times larger than the amount of money they had. It's been estimated that the size of the derivatives market is $650 trillion or even more. From a systemic point of view, nobody really knows what those county counterparty obligations are and the, the degree to which they are actually um, uh, covered, meaning are those risks really covered? And in the fall of 2008, when Lehman Brothers went down, it was almost like we got a glimpse of the matrix. In 2008, after having a whole year of premonitions that I should make some changes because I knew for the whole year of 2007 that I wasn't comfortable with the stock market and I didn't know what it was because I didn't understand how my money was invested. I just trusted these two women and I said, okay, they have what's best for me at heart. It never really got in how this money was being made. <laughs> and it was never really clear to me that the way I was participating in this debt economy was not actually in alignment with my values. I didn't understand that on the facts side, but I understood it intuitively. And then 2008 came, wham, exactly my worst nightmare happened. I lost money, more money than I ever thought I was gonna have in my life. And I was in a complete state of both terror and rage, not just at them, but at myself. I was really angry at me that I didn't know how to steward this money because part of it was my inheritance from my parents, which they worked really hard for. Part of it was me squirreling away money every year, not taking vacations with my kids, not doing all kinds of things so I'd have a nest egg when I got to be 60. It was so shocking and overwhelming that my worst fear came true. Debt has always been used as a bargaining chip in investments. But this new era of gambling was different and had all the makings of a perfect storm. Lack of transparency and deregulation. The massive scale of money and risk, combined with a global economy that was more interconnected than ever before. Anger is justifiable anger 
at the hoax that that we've all been we've been participating you know in a giant ponzi scheme basically i would say the occupy wall street and the occupy movement more generally is from a social science point of view a kind of long awaited response to a period of financial shenanigans basically financial malfeasance and criminal activity, um, captured government, which crashed our economy. You strip away all of the complicated details of finance. This is really a, a problem of democracy. We've learned in the last couple of years of crisis that the Federal Reserve is inescapably political. And when I say political, I mean it decides really large questions for the for the, all of us. And it does that generally behind closed doors, without consulting the public, without accountability to the public or our elected representatives. And that's wrong. That's just wrong. It's wrong in a country that claims to be a self-governing democracy. We have hit the limits to a system and culture that idolizes money over human relationships and disregards the natural world that sustains us. And besides, do you really want to continue living in a world that values money more than life? Somehow the faith in that system and all of the apparatus of Wall Street and watching whether the Dow Jones is going up or down, that whole culture um, has to be called into question and that we are losing faith in that is a good thing. The model of economic growth that has prevailed for really the last 200 years and has delivered gorgeous wealth and abundance uh, widely in the world is, is profoundly flawed and, and, dis and destructive at the same time. And it cannot continue cannot continue. On the surface, it creates a big, scary monster. But underneath, I think, actually, it's a blessing. Underneath this is, I think, the yearning we all feel deep down, that there is something better for humanity. Now that we've uncomfortably, but necessarily, peeled back the layers on our financial tangle, let's look at the opportunities and changes growing out of this time of crisis a time in which real answers are not readily available because solutions from yesterday simply aren't adequate for the world we live in today. We are moving through a great transition in human history. It's the end of the fossil fuel early industrial age, and the post-industrial information age has well begun. As conventional top-down solutions offer no sufficient remedies, we, the people, are acting to create new flows of well-being for humanity. We are telling a new story about who we are and what's possible. I tell the story, the story of a more beautiful world. To me, that's part of a new story of money and more broadly, a new story of the people. So I think what's happening now is that humanity is entering into adulthood and the crises that are converging together at our time, in a way, they're the coming of age ordeal that one must pass through to enter a state of adulthood. This means that we really have to re-perceive everything. So one day I had this really amazing experience for one long moment. All of the structure of the world of money and my beliefs around it, of worth, of who has it, who doesn't, just dissolved. Instead, I was breathing and being in a world where there was so much beauty and so much abundance and so much support and so much reciprocity. It's like I could just tap into this universal life-giving reciprocity that I was a part of that moved through me and just flowed.
So I just wanted to take a moment to uh, go over what we talked about. Since the time of my bankruptcy, I've been a lot more aware of the currents, the, you know, the flow of my life and playing with different payment models for my work. I've experimented with quite a few. And what's important to me is this reciprocity now, how I get to give, how I get to receive, and how the people I'm with also get to do that. So for example, I offer a pay what you can and pay it forward option to my clients. And all that means simply is that you pay what you can comfortably afford given your budget, your life, you get to decide what that is. And then whatever the remainder is in terms of my standard rate, I invite you to agree and commit to sharing your gifts somehow to somebody else. I think we're all here to share our gift. And money is just one way that we give thanks for that gift. What I see happening in the world is globalization is our turn now to take our own species of lots of individuals and nations that have been in competition with each other and bring them together cooperatively as a global family. So we're, we're learning in a lot of ways and through, this, through the science of ecology, um, even in, in quantum mechanics, you know, we're learning that this rigid distinction between myself and yourself and yourself and the objective universe just isn't true. And that shifts the paradigm of the world from a you or me world to a you and me world where there's enough for both of us to make it at no one's expense. And that's a completely different relationship with life, with one another, and with reality. There's a maturation curve going on here. There's a youthful phase that's creative and competitive, and there's a mature phase in which the competition becomes friendly and the cooperation dominates. The explosion of digital technologies and social media networks are forging a new circulatory system for humanity, reflecting our profoundly interconnected nature. This new reality brings a fresh economic vision into the world that includes innovative systems of currency and a changing culture of money. The first step is, is a fairly modest one, which is people begin in conversations among themselves. They can ask themselves, not just who they're mad at in politics and who they like to throw out of office, or not even just railing at, at uh, greedy bankers, but, okay, we're in for deep change here. What would we like this country to be? I would do a uh, redistribution of the economic wealth. I think I would uh, legislate by fiat uh, universal brotherhood. Every person, like out of the goodness of their own heart, uses their money efficiently to help others. Countless organizations and initiatives are sprouting up around the world, transcending the old model of scarcity and competition, and working to mobilize a new economy. There need be no scarcity in the information age because uh, if uh, you give me information, I have it and you still have it. So everything, all of the intellectual models of the new economy are about cooperation, sharing, and abundance. The Occupy movement, expressing similar underlying grievances as the Tea Party, stands on the shoulders of social movements from the 60s. The early encampments modeled some of the key features of this new economy, displaying a shift from top-down concentrated power to decentralized participatory decision-making. The movement has engaged in collaborative, egalitarian, transparent, and ecological practices using peer-to-peer -peer and open source technologies. Occupy was criticized early on for having no single demand. That's because the movement seeks to fundamentally alter the flow of human civilization, knowing that money plays a crucial role in that shift. This movement is very much about building cooperative relationships. It's about working together for a common goal. And when people are able to plug into those kinds of situations where they're working with uh, other people in a very cooperative way for a common goal, it is some of the most deeply satisfying, fulfilling, and life-affirming activity that people can have. The populist movements of this era reflect our need to move beyond patchwork solutions. They are expressions of our hunger for transformation, 
our hunger for a better future. I don't want to get rid of money. Money is one of the most useful institutions humans have ever created. But it is useful and productive as a means of exchange when it is continuously directed into productive, uh, productive activity and productive exchange. Money evolved to organize the flows of human interaction within an economy. In other words, money was based on relationship serving to connect human gifts with human needs. In our highly connected and fragile world today, how do we restore the heart of relationship into our systems of money? A healthy money system uh, has to decentralize, and the money has to correspond to the actual uh, valuable productivity that's going on on the ground and uh, relate very closely to the actual value of the natural resources. How do we create a, a monetary unit that is democratic, accessible, and retains its value? Transforming the money system raises more questions than answers. Do we replace the debt-based fiat currency? With what? Who issues the currency and how? Do we restructure and regulate the banking industry? What form and how? The issuance of money really needs to be a governmental function and, and it needs to be managed in a, a totally accountable and transparent way. We need some real money out there that is not debt-based. Print some dollars that nobody has to pay back Pay, pay some expenses with them and get them out there in the system. What ought to happen now is a fundamental reordering of the financial system. And that means breaking up big banks and imposing real controls and prohibitions on, on financiers uh, that will prevent this disaster from happening again. You don't have to bail out these banks. You don't even need those banks. We don't need them at all. We can set up our own banks with pristine set of books. And now you've got a bank. Let's say it was Bank of America. Now you've got a bank in every single town that's actually a Bank of America. In other words, it's literally a public bank, a bank of the people, owned by the people, serving the people that's like non-profit. There's nothing so esoteric or, or extreme about this. this. This is the kind of banking system we had when I was growing up. We called it a unitary banking system. Uh, for the most part, banks, you know, a, a local community bank was not even allowed to have a branch. So it really kept the, the financial power decentralized and rooted in a community. In addition to restoring old healthy forms such as public banking, there is a dizzying array of innovation raining down on the soil of this emerging economy. We are seeing new models of banking, new financing, lending, and payment platforms. Our innate creativity, aided by technology, is reinventing finance, banking, and money from the ground up. The economy of the 21st century has to look way more diverse. The, the, the model, the picture that I use is one of biodiversity. Uh, so if you look at the federal currency as a monocrop, right? If there's a blight in a monocrop, the whole farm is lost, right? If you have a diverse set of crops and you lose one of those, you still have other means of growing food. Thousands of new systems of currency are being developed that work alongside national money and provide diversity to the monetary ecology. Sometimes called alternative or complementary currencies, the systems are global, regional, and local in scale, and vary greatly in terms of how they function and the purposes they serve. For example, community currencies exist based on different assets, such as local resources, or time, or volunteerism. Mutual credit systems, such as LETS, or local exchange trade systems, allow cashless trading amongst members. And sophisticated commercial trading or barter exchanges have been operating successfully worldwide for years. In total, these new systems are restoring democracy and resilience to all layers of the economy. When you realize that you have taken on this amount of debt at this stage in your life, and you realize that, this, that the debt situation and scenario is one, not an uncommon situation for people our age and our demographic, but two, a systemic problem. When you put that together, you realize, hey, we've got to create our, our, our next step out of this. Coming from a situation like this, 
it's definitely a motivating factor to go and do meaningful work in the community to provide new ways of being and doing and co-creating. We want to make sure the future generations aren't stuck in the same situation as we've found ourselves in. That's it. So this is how the Hero Rewards program works. People do good deeds in the community, like planting trees at the local orchard event through community organizations that offer these events. They sign up, and after they complete an event, they earn a merit. And this merit is exchangeable for promotions at local merchants like yourself. You set up a deal that you'll honor the merit for, like buy one, get one free cup of tea. So with the system, we're gonna do three things. We're gonna support local nonprofits and doing great things in the community. We're gonna get locals more local purchasing power, and we're gonna generate more deal flow for local merchants. We see this system as one of many uh, transition systems in the transaction world that's designed to lessen our dependence on the current money system. You know, the more and more people realize what goods and resources and value they intrinsically have inside themselves to communicate and to share with themselves and others, you know, that can be reflected and that is what's reflected in this system. So that people can interact in new ways that aren't mm -hmm. so dependent on how many little dollar bills we have printed and are out flowing at a given time because that was just an agreement. We made it, we made it up and we can do that again. I think these complementary community currencies, they will allow us to create a whole new system of exchange that will enable us to live a better life with uh, less production of waste, with more harmonious relationships amongst people and amongst nations. We're starved of cooperation, we're starved of relationships uh, with nature, with each other. And we can reactivate that by creating currencies that actually, in favor, provide incentives to go in that direction. So I think sustainable abundance is available. We just have to rethink our money. A democratic trickle-up economy is unfolding, powered by people who want a world that values life more than money. It is starting with my personal values. I've spent time thinking about mine uh, and what I care about and the kind of work I do and in how I conduct my life. I think we're gonna have to come back to some basics. We have to look at how we spend money, how we save money, how we use money. And we have to become very political about those three understandings of money. I buy locally. I shop locally, I support locally, because I care about my community. When I have to go outside my community for purchases, I look at corporate behavior. I want to see if they uphold the same kind of values I have. Values are going to be what get us out of this. This is very profound, and it's shown up in a number of different ways. Socially responsible investing, which is now 30 years into its evolution is now uh, over a three trillion dollar marketplace where people are saying i want my money invested consistent with my values and with mission and purpose behind it the marketplace is democratic if we choose to make it such and we've had tremendous success in the past you know we got rid of apartheid in south africa because we refused to support corporations that contributed to apartheid if a company was doing business in South Africa, the pension funds would stand up at the annual meeting and say, we're going to divest of your stock unless you get out of South Africa. And that actually worked. And, and I would argue that's probably the trigger that brought the end of apartheid. Um, so, so the power of money and the power of capital can, can move mountains. How to do more local stuff like some of the funds that you described to me or some of the community banks. Real huge shift came when I decided to go to someone who was not with one of the big investment houses, really his own person. Everything in me told me, yes. And it was so hard to trust that. I couldn't get corroboration from anyone. My family was all against me. My sisters thought I was nuts. My daughter was totally behind me because she knew that I was really upset that my values were not in alignment with my investment strategy. 
I owe this to my grandchildren. I have to be able to face them. Or when I'm not here anymore, they have to be able to say, well, at least my grandma did something to make the world a better place. Because that's what my parents did. We need to think more intentionally about what real investment capital flows into. That real investment flow is, is very much what will determine the quality or the characteristics of the economic system in the future. So, you know, to, to make it real simple, if, if real investment capital flows into building a coal mine, we have one set of 30 to 50 year outcomes. And if real capital goes into building a solar farm or a wind farm, we have a different set of outcomes uh, from an ecosystem point of view. If everybody took that step today and thought about how you spent your dollar, your $10, your $100, but you really begin to deliberately, in everything you do, look at how you spend your money or how you save your money, and does this really fit your values and how you want to be in this world? It's okay for business to make profit. It doesn't have to be based on the premise that Milton Friedman defined that the only business of business is to maximize profits regardless of social and environmental costs. I wouldn't think, how is this decision going to maximize profits? But how is this decision going to affect my customers and staff and community and uh, my relationship with nature itself? And I think that was really the heart of the success of the White Dog Cafe. We grew in sales to, to $5 million a, a year, and I feel like our success really was uh, based on a different outlook about business and the role of business in community. Because for me, the purpose of business is to serve, and so our mission was to serve fully in four areas, serving our customers, serving our employees, serving our community, and serving nature. In the business world, especially in the United States, success is measured by constant growth, continual growth. And so I would sometimes think to myself, well, am I just a big sissy because I don't have a chain of white dog cafes around the country? Uh, but I, I realized that what was most important to me about my business was the authenticity of the relationships. And the cost you pay in growing larger is the weakening of those relationships. And I started thinking about how, hey, we can grow in other ways than material. We can grow by raising consciousness. We can grow by, by increasing our knowledge. We can grow by deepening our relationships. We can grow by uh, being healthier, uh, increasing our well-being, having more fun. That all these ways of growing in a non-material way, that became the way that I grew my business. If you let go of trying to get more of what you don't really need, which is what we're desperately trying to get more of, what we're trained to try to get more of, it frees up oceans of energy to turn and nourish, pay attention to, and make a difference with what you already have. When you nourish what you already have, pay attention to it, make a difference with it, in the nourishment of that attention and intention, it expands before your very eyes. We humans, by the grace of evolution, receive neurochemical rewards of pleasure, endorphins, we've heard of them, haven't we? Not only when we are cared for, but when we care for another, be it a child, be it a lover, be it a friend, be it a pet. Getting involved with Boulder Giving was one of the first times that I kind of publicly acknowledged that we like to live generously and it's a joyful thing, it's a good thing. We did start being much more clear that we've got this, why, why are we trying to maximize our money? Just put money to use for the things we believe in. People don't have what they need to live and we have everything that we need to live. Our 2000 income was quite small, $35,000, but we continued our commitment to living a philanthropically generous lifestyle by tithing a minimum of 35 to 40 percent of our income. We used our savings to fund these items since our income was so low, and at 64 percent of our adjusted gross income. And then you just <laughs> file your returns. We don't do extreme sports, we do extreme giving. <laughs> it's like cell division. The more you give and live, attuned to other people, the more I have of myself. So I think that's part of what has changed a lot. And that's part of what makes me feel good or gives me joy or makes me feel like 
there's another reason that I exist in this world. The, the greatest gift we have is the gift of life and the gift of community and not money. And so at the core is a call to generosity, not a call to possess things. Because if life teaches us anything, it teaches us that we will have to let go. This is the reconceptualization, is that the 401k uh, wasn't real abundance. And the abundance that we can all create together is uh, of a completely different nature. So we're, we're about to go over the San Mateo Bridge and I'm going to tag the person behind me um, by paying for their bridge toll and I will give them this card, which is a, a smile card. Hi. Could I get a receipt for that? Sure. And also, um, I want to I wanna pay for the toll for the folks behind me. So could you pay, uh, take that and give them this card as well? Before when I would meet someone that I probably would never see again, you know, maybe it's cause to just ignore them or not really engage with them. And now when I meet someone that I may never see again, it's almost an opportunity. Like, I may never see this person again. How can I do something to make them happy? <laughs> she smiled. <laughs> when you can expand your sense of self beyond your narrow interests and start putting someone else's interests before yours, even just for a fraction of a second, you feel connected to them. When I connect to another person, then their joy becomes my joy. The real wealth of a nation, indeed of the world, uh, does not consist of these financial instruments or objects. It consists of the contributions of people and of nature. Family and love is what makes me feel wealthy, not dollars. What makes me truly feel wealthy is when the sun shines, when I had eaten a good bread, and when I can be near my love. What defines me is my relationships to the world around me, and so my relationships and my, my friends and even the people that are not my friends, you know, make me wealthy. The new field of happiness studies is revealing what we already know in our hearts. We exist to connect. So the wealth is the tendency of the human being to stand with each other, to stand for each other's potential in the world. This is wealth, when the economic flow is just. I do not believe in individual, insatiable appetites. I believe we are connected in a way that we care for each other. I do not believe we're gonna run out. I believe there's a prosperity, a creativeness in, in being human. If we know how to align ourselves spiritually with our values, with our beliefs, in the energy around us, we are prosperous, we are affluent. The old economy of endless growth, fueled by overconsumption and greed, is dying. And a new economy, based on a new understanding of human nature and planetary health, is emerging. It's like a design revolution from top to bottom. And that ought to be fun, because everybody can be involved. Changes in the system and our culture are doable, but won't be easy, because change of this scale is inherently volatile and takes time, and will meet continued resistance from the ideology and institutions of the old economy. We feel in our gut that the world could be different, and each of us has a part to play in bringing it forward. This is clearly the most interesting time in human history. I mean, other times in history thought they were it, but they're wrong, this is it. <laughs> You know, this is the time in which there is such an accelerated acceleration of events, of shifts, of whole system transitions. It depends on how fast these, the new generation gets it. They're educating themselves. There are wonderfully instructive materials available now on the internet. And I hope this film will be part of that process of getting people to get that there are different ways of doing things and that there is nothing to stop us. My favorite Rumi poem ends with the line, 
Why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Now is the time to come together as a people in our local communities and across the globe to debate and discuss, to innovate and experiment, to reconnect and regenerate, and reclaim our humanity in the story of our beautiful world. Now is the time to walk away from the false rule of money and undam the rivers of true wealth with money in service to life. The future is summoning us to live the world we know is possible 